Uh, Dr. Nelson, uh, assuming that all of these Part 135 pioneers succeed, the ones that we're seeing now, what do you see as the future uh, on the horizon for drone delivery operations? This is a topic, Don, near and dear to me because I have been in my past, with not disclosing my age, many moons ago, a drone, I'm sorry, a uh, manned Part 135 pilot. I, wor I worked for an air cargo operation. So I, I concur with everything everyone said, especially Mary Caitlin. Um, you have to have a robust system in place for Part 135. That being said, we've got pioneers doing it, and that's just amazing how far we've come. Um, I do believe that retail logistics networks will change. Um, if companies move toward the drone delivery system, I think the number of last mile warehouses would likely increase in the future to ensure a faster delivery time. And last mile delivery, meaning transportation from local warehouses to the customer, would be more cost efficient with drones. And drones can travel over congested areas along a straight path, so it reduces the time. And also reach rural areas where perhaps the roads are uh, few or unimproved. Um, but then like other technological innovation, um, some conventional jobs might be eliminated. And however, other newer jobs will be created. Um, you'll see drone maintenance, drone monitoring personnel, load masters, visual observers, all those kinds of things. And then what also makes me very pleased is that the type certification for UAS, that is something that we really desperately need to move this industry forward so that we can improve the quality of the manufacturing, better schedule maintenance, and just make it in general safer, kind of like with our part 135 of manned operations, kind of the same thing. I'm really looking forward to the flying cars, though. That would be the ultimate in advanced air mobility, especially uh, David is nodding his head. Yes, that's definitely where I'm eagerly waiting. Yeah, I'm, work so I'm working on it. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, David, go ahead. I said I'm working on it. <laughs> so much to be done and definitely so much to talk about when you think about, as you just said, advanced air mobility and how that's so intertwined with urban traffic management or unmanned traffic management. Um, we're really running short on time. So I'm gonna call an audible here and fast forward to, to remote ID because it's something we've talked about. It's gonna be at the heart of 107 and opening up uh, you know, operations over people and beyond visual line of sight, likely in that order as David mentioned earlier. So let's take a couple minutes here uh, in the home stretch to talk about our ID even though we're eagerly awaiting the final rule to come out, hopefully at the end of this year. Uh, I'm gonna go over to Mary Caitlin and ask you, uh, can you just give us really quick overview, because we're running short on time. What is our ID uh, and what is it gonna do for us? Sure, Don. Remote ID is the concept of a system that identifies drones that are operating in the national airspace system, similar to an electronic license plate. Um, now, this is not a novel, con a novel concept in the transportation space because we already identify many other kinds of vehicles, license plates for cars and numbers for aircraft, et cetera. What is novel about our ID is that the operator of a drone and a vehicle are not co-located, hence the remote aspect. So the draft rule or the NPRM um, described three waves of remotely identifying drones, standard remote ID, limited remote ID, um, or operating within an FAA-recognized identification area, also known as a FRIA, love our acronyms. Uh, limited remote ID would require the UAS to remain within visual line of sight um, at 400 feet of the operator, so no beyond visual line of sight operations under limited remote ID. If you want to fly more than 400 feet away from the operator, you're going to need to use a standard remote ID UAS. The draft rule also proposed that standard remote ID use both network and broadcast remote ID, while limited remote ID will use only network, so a heightened standard um, for the standard remote ID UAS. Any drone that's required to be registered will have to comply with this rule, so UAS that are used for commercial operations under Part 107 or recreational UAS that weigh over 0.55 pounds. Um, and that's my very quick run through of, of remote ID. Yeah, I mean, there's so many nuances and, and you know, for those that had the pleasure of reading uh, the, the, the draft rule, the initial, uh, initial draft was like 316 pages of goodness. And, and so 
Uh, and my understanding, right, Ryan and David, there was about 53,000 comments that came in uh, in March, when, by March, when that rule uh, comment period closed out. That's a lot. I feel like just in my experience, that's probably the most that I've seen in the commercial drone arena, at least to date. So my question is this, I mean, COVID happened after that. Uh, you know, is the FAA really on track to release that rule, the final rule by the end of this year? Ryan or David, over to you. Yep, actually, yes. It's important to note, once the final rule is released, uh, drone manufacturers will have two years to comply with the new design requirements for new UASs, and owners and operators will have three years to comply with the operational aspects of the rule. So they must have a, a remote ID equipment on, on their drones to be able to operate. All right. Well, we look forward to it. I know last, uh, was it New Year's Eve, I think, when the initial uh, draft uh, of the notice dropped. So uh, that was a fun holiday for me reading all of that. Uh, so we look forward to more happy holidays this year, I guess. Um, Dr. Nilsson, uh, how do you see remote ID affecting daily operations of folks like yourself or other commercial drone pilots? Yes, um, I believe remote ID will normalize advanced high return on investment operations in our airspace. Uh, I think it'll increase uh, public trust in UAS as well as comfort with more widespread commercial operations. For us in the industry, I hope it will enable safety data gathering so that we can inform smarter policy and rulemaking moving forward. And lastly, it, it's my hope that it will prevent unnecessary overregulation that might otherwise stunt this growth in this industry. All right, well, we're, we're in the home stretch here. So I'm gonna give everybody an opportunity to give me, to give us your 30 second elevator speech. A lot to, lots remains to be seen, right? In the regulatory commercial arena for drones. What, what are your, if you have 30 seconds to tell the audience something important that you want them to take away, what is that? Let's go to you first, Ryan. I would say uh, the, the quick and dirty, uh, check the FAA website, check your resources, do your homework and call, call the FAA, call, call us, call me if you have to. Uh, and, and we can give you the information. Don't assume anything, go and do the research, do your homework. All right, David. Uh, we have a game changer here for Part 135 UAS certifications. There's a new rule that just recently came out, uh, type certification of certain unmanned aircraft systems. This new rule allows for certain SUASs to be type certified when they will be operating under either Part 91 or Part 135 rules. So as Dr. Nielsen was saying, she was hoping she would see this. This is a new rule that just came out uh, recently. And there's more information on the, on the Federal Register of, uh, on this uh, NFA website for this new rule. Lots of amazing developments. Dr. Nielsen. So of course the educator in the room <laughs> does this every day to my students. Please read, read, read everything. Everything you can get your hands on from trusted sources, as you know, from the FAA on down and just ask a lot of questions. There's a lot of help out there. I would just say, just read. And yes, like Don said, we're going to be doing a lot of that for this New Year's holiday. <laughs> All right. And last but not least, again, Mary Caitlin. Stay engaged in the industry and cast a wide net when you're building your teams, right? A, sex, a successful operation needs a team. You need the operator, you need an aircraft, and you need technical and legal advisors. And you can't forget the importance of the role of the FAA in all of this as well. So you need to cultivate those relationships. Um, as everyone said, we're heading into a year with a lot of a lot on the horizon for drones in the regulatory space. So be sure to in, stay engaged with um, with thought leaders and with legal counsel who are knowledgeable in this area, so that you can stay up to date on the latest developments. Um, one great way to do that is to just click subscribe, subscribe to mailing lists, um, subscribe to the mailing list of a law firm that does work in this area. Um, for example, you can do that on my firm's website, for example, and that way that you know all the relevant client alerts and newsletters come right to your inbox as soon as they're published. Thank you all so much. And thank, thank you out there in audience land. We hope that we gave you some practical advice, some background, maybe you didn't know, some tips and some resources that you can go to. Uh, as has been mentioned, we're gonna have some resources uh, available 
uh, for for your review. And you have Mary Caitlin's uh, law firm website. You also have my website at p3techconsulting.com. I have a lot of articles. If you ever want to geek out and really get into some of these meaty and even weird topics, because that's what I love getting into. Well, thank you all so much for everybody who attended today. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you about drone regulations in the commercial space. We hope you learned something new. We hope you have some great resources now, and we hope you keep in touch. So reach out to us. In the meantime, take care, be well, and stay safe and out here. Thank you.